uh, the, the Bible talks about the heart in Proverbs 4.23. Above all else, it says, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. And the way the Bible uses the term heart is to recognize the heart is the command center of life. Uh, all the, the, the hopes, the dreams, the aspirations of the person lie within the heart, and from the heart they set the course of life. So that the, the scriptures are very clear with the importance of the heart. Almost 700 passages in the Bible talk to us about the heart and the importance of the heart. It's one of the major themes that is woven throughout the Word of God. And uh, it's hard to overestimate because the, the heart is so important. And so I want to give you a sense real quickly of the breadth of the use of the word heart in the Bible. So we're thinking biblically, we're not just thinking in terms of common parlance and the way we use the word heart. All these activities are activities of the heart. Now let me just, just go through them with you real quickly. I'll tie them to passages of Scripture. I won't give you chapter and verse for obvious reasons. It's just too clumsy. But we think with our hearts. God flooded the world because he saw the thoughts of men's hearts were only evil continually. We remember with our hearts. Moses says to Israel, remember these words of mine. Fix them in your hearts and in your minds. We know with our hearts. Again, Moses to Israel in Deuteronomy. Know in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord disciplines you. We discern with our hearts. The discerning heart, uh, the Proverbs tell us, acquires knowledge. Uh, we uh, store things in our hearts. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Uh, we, we see with our hearts. We make connections with our hearts. Paul prays in Ephesians chapter 1 that the eyes of your heart would be opened, that you'd see the glorious riches of his inheritance in the saints. Uh, we meditate with our hearts. In the last verse of Psalm 19, may the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Uh, think of Mary. She takes these things. She learns of Jesus. She ponders them in her heart. Now, if I stop there just for a minute, let me observe that all of those are things we think of as cognitive activities. <clears throat> the Bible says they're activities of the heart. Whatever we make of the brain's amazing capacity to store information and collate information and recall information. I mean, you've got this incredible storage and retrieval system in your cranium. You know, I mean, you can pull a picture of your bedroom when you were a child out of your head. I mean, it's amazing uh, capacity the brain has. But whatever we make of the brain's ability to recall, to store, to collate information, the course of thought, the scripture makes it clear, is the heart. The, the heart sets the course of thought. The brain is the, the brain is, is, is an apparatus that's used by the heart in, in projecting the, the desires and ambitions of the person. Uh, so we live, we live from our hearts. And, and the Bible talks about the heart uh, and, and about that inner man in so many ways. You know, the inner man, the innermost being, the soul, the spirit. All those terms are really, in some ways, are summarized by the word heart. The heart is the command center of our lives. We, we fear with our hearts. Remember Saul before the final battle? He goes to the witch of Endor. She conjures up Samuel. Samuel prophesies of his death and the death of his sons in the battle that will follow the next day. And when Saul sees the Philistine armies gathering in the morning, we read he was afraid and terror filled his heart. We fear with our hearts. We grieve with our hearts. God says to Eli, the priest in Shiloh, because you've not restrained your sons, all of your sons will fill your eyes with tears and your heart with grief. Uh, we grieve with our hearts. We we hate with our hearts. Remember when David's coming into the city of God, he throws off his outer garment. He's dancing before the Ark of the Covenant. And and uh, uh, his wife is observing him. And we read that she despised him in her heart. We hate with our hearts. We lust with our hearts. A warning in Proverbs chapter 6, speaking of the wayward woman, is do not lust in your heart after her beauty. We love God and others with our hearts. We give with our hearts. Everyone should give what he's decided in his heart to give, for the Lord loves a cheerful giver. We turn to God or away from God in our hearts. The end of Deuteronomy talks about that. See to it that there is no man or woman among you today whose heart turns away from the Lord. We pray with our hearts. Remember Hannah in the temple. Her lips are moving. There's no sound. Eli thinks she's drunk. She's praying in her heart. To the Lord. And when she receives the answer to her prayer, she says, My heart rejoices 
in God my Savior. Uh, we become proud in our hearts. Hezekiah was full of pride in his heart, and God humbled him of the pride of his heart. We sing, uh, or we become pr uh, proud, we sing with our hearts. Uh, Paul exhorts us in Ephesians chapter 5 to sing and make music in our hearts to the Lord. Uh, we love God with our hearts, uh, and, and we're faithful, upright, righteous in our hearts. David is described that way by his son Solomon. Now, when we talk about the heart, it gets tricky because you can't trust your heart. Uh, Hebrews, or excuse me, Jeremiah 17.9 reminds us the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Uh, your heart will lie to you. Your heart will tell you things are true that are not true. You can't believe your heart. My heart has been telling me I need a new pickup truck. <laughs> my wife is telling me that my heart is deceitful and cannot be trusted. Uh, you know, you know we, we, our hearts will lie to us. Uh, you know, one of the worst pieces of advice you could give is just follow your heart uh, because your heart will deceive you. Uh, we love God uh, with our hearts. Uh, we our, we set up idols in our hearts. You know, there's a fascinating passage in Ezekiel 14. It says, my people set up idols in their hearts. The heart is a place where shrines are erected to idols, where, shrine, where those idols are worshipped and served. Those things that become the conditions of my happiness, the things I must have other than God in order to be happy with life. Those are idols that we set up in our hearts. Or uh, our hearts become hard. Paul speaks of that in Ephesians. In Ephesians 4, people living out of the ignorance in them due to the hardening of their hearts. We seek God with our hearts. My heart says of you, Psalm 27, seek your face, your face, O Lord, I will seek. We repent with our hearts. The sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite heart. David reminds us, Joel 2, rend your hearts and not your garments. Return unto the Lord. Uh, we believe with our hearts. It's with the heart. Romans 10, that we believe and are saved. And of course, the promise of the new covenant is the promise of a changed heart. I will ha take out your heart of stone, give you a heart of flesh. Now, now I've taken a few minutes with this, uh, with you to, uh, on this, with, with, with you to just underscore the importance of this truth that we live out of our hearts. The heart is the wellspring of life. <laughs> the choices, the, the that we make, the dreams we have, the things we say and do have their origin in the heart. We, we don't live just out of the facts and circumstances of our existence, but our hearts really tell us how to interpret the facts and circumstances of our existence. So this is such important truth. It's, it's, and of course, it has tremendous implications for, for raising children. For, it has tremendous implications for every generation. Um, if you think about it, it's these uh, attitudes, of, uh, these activities of the heart that actually push and pull behavior. All behavior is motivated. It's all driven by something internally. There's always a payoff for us in all the things that we say and do. Uh, so these activities of the heart drive behavior. It's also a great area in which to develop questions for our children, even questions we can ask of ourselves. You know, what was your heart after in this or that situation? What was your heart lusting after? What was your heart desiring? What was your heart grieving? What was your heart praising? What was the fear of your heart? Uh, all those are good questions to ask ourselves and good questions to frame for our children. And of course, it's a great area of Bible study for a family, and I'll give you some suggestions about how to do that uh, in a few minutes. But the heart is one of these major themes that is woven throughout the Scripture. Uh, every, it's, just, it's a thread of truth. It's one of these longitudinal themes that we find throughout the Word of God, the importance of the heart. As I mentioned, almost 700 passages in the Bible talk to us about the importance of the heart. Now, many Old Testament passages uh, that uh, talk about this theme, and I'll just look at a couple of these with you. Uh, these, some of these are familiar. You might remember this story in 1 Samuel chapter 16. Samuel is sent to anoint a new king over Israel, and he goes to the house of Jesse, to Bethlehem. Uh, they go out to offer sacrifices. In the course of things, the sons of Jesse are brought before the prophet. He's waiting for a word from God about whom he should anoint. And uh, the first young man that comes into his presence, you probably don't remember this fellow's name because he doesn't become the king. It's Eliab. He's the eldest. He's the one you would think would become the king. But the first young man, he comes into Samuel's presence. Samuel thinks this must be the man. He's tall. He's handsome. He looks regal. 
He looks like the kind of person people would follow into battle. And God speaks to Samuel. Remember those words. He says, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. What is God concerned with? God's concerned with the heart. Now, we get very focused with our kids, don't we, on the external appearance stuff. Well, how others will interpret them, what others will think of them, how they will look to others. I have, I'm blessed. I have nine grandchildren. We are super blessed because all of our grandchildren have grown up within five miles of us. So we spend a lot of time with them, and once a month we have a Sunday afternoon together, and we enjoy a meal together and have a family time. So we were having one of those family times. My youngest grandson at the time was sitting on the living room floor watching the other kids play. The reason he was watching and not playing was he was at that stage of life where he needed pillows propped around him to keep from falling over. So his mother had propped pillows around him. He's watching the other kids play. I happened to notice he's wearing a pair of $35 Nike running shoes. <laughs> now, now think about this. What is the function of running shoes on a baby who needs pillows propped around him to keep from falling over? He's not going to run in these shoes. It's a fashion statement. But you get that, don't you? I mean, we're so concerned with how, what others will think of our children, how they will look to others, how others will interpret them. We get very concerned with those external things. What's God concerned with? God's concerned with the heart. He's concerned with what's going on inside. One of my favorite uh, passages about the heart in the Old Testament is this one in Deuteronomy chapter 10, uh, because uh, I love this passage because Moses asks this great question in 10.12, he says, Now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you? Isn't that a great question? You've asked yourself that question. What does God want from you? What is God asking for? What, what is God after? But that you fear the Lord your God and walk in his ways and love him and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. What does God want? He wants wholehearted devotion to Him, wholehearted service to Him. He wants our hearts. And, and the, that theme we find again and again, the, I'll let you look up some of these other passages in your own leisure, but, but the, uh, the importance of the heart, it's a major theme throughout the Word of God. Uh, from cover to cover. If we were going to look at all the Old Testament passages about the heart, we would quickly run out of time before we would ever run out of passages. It would take us hours and hours and hours just to look through the Old Testament passages to say nothing of the New Testament use of that same theme. And of course, it's not surprising that in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, the heart is one of these reoccurring themes that comes out again and again in Christ's ministry. I mean, if you think about the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, I mean, that largest sermon we have of Christ, Matthew 5 to 7, the heart is one of the reoccurring themes throughout that psalm, or, or that, that sermon. Uh, there in the Beatitudes, before, when he's just beginning the sermon, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Later, he talks about treasure, and he makes the observation, whatever your treasure owns your heart. <laughs> where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. And, and it's interesting what Jesus does when he applies the law in the Sermon on the Mount. There's a section in chapter 5 where he's making application of the law in the sermon. And his application of the law is very fascinating because he applies the law in terms of the heart rather than in terms of external behavior. So he doesn't focus on behavior, things said and done. He focuses, he takes the application of the law inside. So he says, you think of murder as killing someone. But I tell you, you can commit bloodless murder if you hate your brother in your heart. You're guilty of murder. Do you see what Jesus has done with the, with the application of the law? Rather than taking the focus out there in behavior, the things that are observable, the things that can be seen and heard, he takes it inside and he says, when I give my heart to that which God forbids, I have broken the law of God. 
You remember, he does the same thing with adultery. He says, you can commit adultery from across the room. You can look at a woman to lust after her. You can think, what would it be like to be with her, to touch her, to hold her? And Jesus says, you have committed adultery with her already. Where? Not in your bed, in your heart. Do you see what Jesus is doing with the law? It's, it's, it's very fascinating. It's very instructive for those of us who preach and teach. Because his focus in applying the law is not just on the external behavioral things. His application is not just about how we can be bright, shiny Christians who look good on the outside. He takes the application inside. And he, he says, when you give your heart to what God forbids, you've broken the law of God. It, 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 it's penetrating deep uh, analysis of, of sin and what sin is like and the importance of of our hearts. Well, that, that's a major theme. I mean, throughout Christ's ministry, this is one of the reoccurring themes. Uh, if you, uh, there's a couple passages in the New Testament in in Matthew chapter 15 and Mark 7. These are parallel passages. I'll read the Mark passage. I read the Matthew one yesterday. I'll read the Mark one today. Uh, but in these passages, Jesus is uh, uh, teaching, and the 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 Pharisees come to Jesus with accusations against the disciples. And the accusation of the Pharisees is, your disciples have defiled themselves because they've eaten without going through a ceremonial washing. Therefore, they're defiled through what they have eaten. Jesus goes off on the Pharisees. I mean, he rebukes them so forcibly, the disciples are actually shocked by the forcefulness of Christ's rebuke. And he quotes the prophet Isaiah. He says, these people, these Pharisees, they honor me with their lips. Their lips are saying God honoring words, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are just the rules of man. And, and he just rebukes them very flat-footedly. And, and you get a sense, particularly in the Matthew passage, of how shocked the disciples are by the forcefulness of Christ's rebuke. And after the Pharisees are gone and the dust has settled, they come to Jesus and they say, Lord, connect the dots for us. Help us to understand this teaching. And Jesus says these words. I'm beginning with verse 18 in Mark 7. Are you so dull, he says, don't you see that nothing that enters a man from outside can make him unclean? Now, that was the accusation of the Pharisees. Your disciples are unclean because they've eaten without ceremonial washing. He says, no, you're not defiled by what? You eat because it doesn't go into your heart. It goes into your stomach and then out of your body. In other words, what you eat passes through you. But he goes on and he says, it's what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. Now, if we're thinking about child rearing, we could say it's what comes out of a child that makes him unclean. Because man is being used here generically to describe all of humanity. Men, women, boys, girls, we're all captured by this. Uh, it's not just describing the adult male in distinction to women and children. So we could say it's what comes out of a child that makes him unclean. For from within, out of children's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a child unclean. Now, many of the things in that list are things we see in our children. I mean, do you ever see any envy at your house? Did you ever hear these words? It's not fair. I mean, it's not fair as an envy statement, isn't it? Someone else has an advantage I don't have. It's not fair. One of our kids was gone overnight. He had gone to visit a friend. He came home the next day. He was only home for five minutes when he announced, I get to have ice cream today. I said, why do you think you get to have ice cream today? He said, you had ice cream last night when I was gone. I couldn't believe it. This kid came home, checked the box of ice cream to see if any ice cream was missing. And he asserted his right to ice cream. Now, they never come home and say, hey, you had ice cream last night. Good for you. I'm so happy for you. I hope you ate it all. I hope it was good. No, I get ice cream today. You had ice cream last night. It's not fair. You know, we, we see that kind of envy in children, don't we? We see greediness in children. I, I 
pastored for 32 years, and when I was still pastoring the church, I have, I have six grandsons. When I would finish preaching, my grandsons would come to me and they would in the foyer, and they always wanted to go to my office with me. Now, I would love to tell you they wanted to go to my office with me to pray over my sermons, but that's not really the case. They wanted to go to my office with me because I had this large jar of M&Ms in my office, and they wanted M&Ms. So I would take them into my office, and I can promise you there was never a time when one of those little boys reached in and took one M&M. I mean, you know what they did. They buried their hand in the, in the jar. They took as many as their grubby little hands could hold, and they would shove them in their pockets and try to make another pass at it before I got the lid back on. You see, we see that kind of greediness in children, don't we? Or we see malice, malicious behavior. Uh, children doing bad things toward each other just for the joy of badness. I mean, you think, why would you do this to your brother? One of our grandsons wrote this little narrative about himself. I'm not sure what inspired him to write this narrative, but uh, he wrote this little thing under the heading, How I Know I'm a Sinner. I mean, it's not like any of us had any doubts about whether he was a sinner. <laughs> but this little story, How I Know I'm a Sinner, and his story told how that his uh, brother had built a castle out of Legos, and he kicked it and knocked it down. So his brother told his mother what he had done. He lied to his mother and told his mother he stumbled into it by accident. His mother actually scolded his brother for not being more understanding of his clumsiness, and he got away with this lie. So this is how I know I'm a sinner. I read this little thing that he had written. I said, look at you. You are a sinner. But he, you, I mean, what good comes to him from destroying something that his brother made that his brother takes pleasure in? Except there's that malicious stuff we see in our kids sometimes that's so distressing. You see them do bad things just for the joy of being bad. You think, why would you do that to your brother? <laughs> what benefit comes to you from doing that to him? Or we see uh, lewdness in our children. Now, not every child is lewd, but I'll bet there's some parents here today who have uh, one of those kids that picks up every double entendre. You know, you can say some innocent thing and they can turn it into something prurient. I remember one time teaching fourth grade boys, nine-year-old boys, and I, I, I used the word buttress. Oh, this one kid thought that was just a great word because it sounded to him like a private body part. So the rest of the day, he's saying, buttress, buttress, uh, buttress. And he's chortling and poking the other boys. And, and you know, he turns a, an innocent word into something prurient. We, some of our kids, we see that kind of lewdness in them. Or... Uh, Slander. My kids used to come to me slandering their brothers and sisters. Daddy, brother's not being nice to me. I, I, I would say to them, help me understand, why are you telling me this? Would you like for us to pray for your brother? I'm sure he would appreciate our prayers. We could do that. You're not trying to get him in trouble, are you? You wouldn't do that, would you? Or, or deceit. We see deceit in our children. Isn't it amazing how children can deceive you with words that are technically true words? So I asked my eight-year-old, did you remember to brush your teeth? He says, yes, I remembered. Now, I look at his toothbrush. <laughs> this brush has not been wet for three days. I thought you said you brushed your teeth. He says, you didn't ask me if I brushed them. You asked me if I remembered. I did remember, but I didn't brush them. You didn't, I mean, if you'd asked me if I brushed them, you didn't ask me. You asked me if I remember. That, those were your words. Did you remember? You know, these kids, they're all attorneys. <laughs> he understood the intent of your question. He knew you weren't asking, was toothbrushing ever a passing thought today? He knew what you were asking. He answered in a way which was technically true even though it was cunningly designed to deceive you. We, we see this in kids. Sometimes at night, we're having those late night conversations with our spouse, and we'll say, we'll, we'll say, where does he get this from? It must be from your side of the family. <laughs> no one in my family ever acted this way. You know, I think he's just like your brother. <laughs> where does it come from? See, Jesus tells us in this passage, doesn't it? All these evils come from inside, from within, out of the heart. 
And, and that's why I'm making the observation here in this little chart that whatever's come, going on in behavior has its origin in the heart. Now, that's not only true for kids. <laughs> that's true for you and me, too, isn't it? I mean, our anger, our harsh words, our bitterness sometimes, our unkindness, our stubbornness, all those things flow from within. Now, we can, we can attach them to other circumstances and say, well, if you wouldn't do this, I wouldn't do that. And all, but that's all false. We know it's false. Our heart is on display in those things that we say and do that are wrong. Now, in, in Luke chapter 6, Jesus uses this wonderful analogy of a tree. And it's, it's uh, one of those very rich illustrations that Christ uses that is so, uh, so simple and it's so incredibly profound. He says, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. I love verses like this in the Bible. Each word is a single syllable. I mean, it's very simple, and you instantly understand what it's saying. I mean, the, the final test of the tree is the quality of the fruit. If it's good fruit, it's a good tree. Bad fruit, it's a bad tree. And Jesus goes on. He says you can tell what kind of a tree it is by the fruit. So uh, each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People don't pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. Then Jesus makes this application. The good man brings good things out of good, stored up in his heart. And the evil man brings evil things out of evil, stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. Now, I want you to imagine this analogy with me. Imagine with me that in my, at my home in Pennsylvania, I have an apple tree. It blossoms very beautifully in the spring, but when these apples grow to maturity, the apples on this tree cannot be eaten. They're, they're soft and shriveled and spotted and brown and mushy inside. And my wife comes to me. She comes to me year after year. She says, Ted, can't you do something for this tree so that it bears edible apples? I mean, I, mean, I thought that was the idea of having an apple tree. We could actually eat the apples. And so, like any man here, I want to please my wife. I try everything I know to do for the tree. I, I loosen the soil around the tree. I fertilize it. I, I prune the branches. I spray it with an insecticide. But we still have these gnarled, blighted, sapless apples. So one day I'm home on a Saturday, and I say to her, Honey, today I'm going to fix the apple tree. So, I'm, so I go out there with a ladder, climb into the tree, take all the rotten apples off the tree, put them in the compost pile. We live on the Susquehanna River. Below our home, there's an orchard. I go to the orchard below the, our home, buy three boxes of his finest apples, <laughs> take them up to my tree. I shine them all with a rag so they're nice and shiny. I get some string, and I hang these apples on the tree. So I decorate the tree with apples. Now, when I'm all done, it looks beautiful. Apples are symmetrically distributed all over the tree. All these apples are shiny, crisp, juicy, wonderful apples. And I go in and I find Margie. I say, honey, I have a surprise for you. Close your eyes. I lead her to the window that overlooks the tree. Okay, open your eyes. Ta-da. I mean, she looks, this tree looks beautiful. The branches are bowed under the weight of these apples. Each of these apples are shiny, beautiful apples. Now, she's adjusting her glasses. She knows there's something wrong with this picture. So she goes out to take a closer look at the tree, and she discovers all these apples are hanging by monofilament nylon. Now, how would my wife respond to me? She would say, you're a nutcase. <laughs> this is why we don't like to leave you alone for long periods of time. We never know what you might do. I didn't want you to hang apples on the tree. I wanted a tree that bears apples. Think about our kids. How great the temptation is to hang apples on the tree. Tell your sister you're sorry. Sorry. Could you smile at your sister when you say it? Sorry. Okay, you can go play. <laughs> now, we've just hung an apple on the tree, haven't we? It's not a sorry bone in the sorry kid's whole body. And of course, there are so many ways we can do that. We can bribe our children. 
We can offer them incentives and prizes and rewards. I mean, you can get a little child to be good by promising them a sticker. Now, you can't get an eight-year-old to do anything for a sticker. Did you ever notice how there's incentive inflation? <laughs> the older they get, by the time they're teenagers, you can't afford the things that would be motivations for them. So we can bribe them, or, or we can, we can uh, heap guilt on them. You know, I can say to my kids, you know, it just makes me so sad when I see the way you kids fight over your toys. I have no joy in my life. I mean, what can I possibly be happy about when my kids are home fighting over their toys? You know, your mother and I used to talk about how wonderful it would be to have children. <laughs> we had no idea what it'd be like. Or we can, uh, we might even bring Jesus into it. You know, Jesus can see right through the roof into the family room. Where do you think Jesus thinks the way you kids fight over your toys? Not a bad question if you ask it for the right reason. But you know you can ask that question without having any real evangelical objective. You're just rolling out the heavy artillery. <laughs> no, they haven't been listening to me all day. Let's lob Jesus at them this afternoon. Maybe that'll fix them. Or we can, uh, we can threaten our children. You know, do you ever have those nights you put the kids to bed several times? You put them to bed, you're trying to talk over your day and have a little time together as a couple, and, and, and you have this sense of presence beside you. You know, you're, what are you doing up? I put you to bed an hour ago. Or, or you, <coughs> you put, excuse me, you put them to bed, you hear them in their room. They're, they're running, they're jumping, they're diving into each other's beds, and they're cavorting around in there, and you, you go in and quiet them down. Now look, we had a nice night tonight. Don't go ruining it, okay? We read a story, we read the Bible, we played a game. I don't want to hear another sound. So you go back to your conversation. You hear the kids again. Back to their room. What are you doing in your brother's bed? I told you not to get up. I didn't get up. How'd you get in your brother's bed? I went over the dresser, over the windowsill. My feet never touched the floor. <laughs> While you're debating over whether or not one's feet must touch the floor to be up, you happen to notice your three-year-old, who knows what he did with his pillow, but he's inside the pillow cover. He's jumping around. <laughs> Don't laugh at him. It's not funny. <laughs> you quiet them down, back to your conversation. You hear the kids again. And you find yourself hollering threats in the direction of their room. You don't even want to know what will happen if I come to that room one more time. But it'll be messy, and it might be on the news. Now, all those are ways of changing behavior. But they misfire in terms of dealing with our ch children's real need. Because the real need is not a behavior need. I can modify the behavior for the moment, but the real need of my child is not addressed through behaviorism because his real need is he has a heart that is strayed from God's ways like a lost sheep. His real need is his heart. And of course, uh, another problem with that is I'm offering a false basis for ethics because what's the basis for ethics in behaviorism? It's very crassly self-centered. It's what will give me what I want and avoid what I don't want. There's nothing in behaviorism that is about loving God and loving others. It's all very self-centered. And, and, and what's the basis for ethics in a biblical vision? There's a God in heaven who's good, and he's told us how to live for our good and for his glory. So the being and existence and revelation of God is the basis for ethics in a biblical vision. Of course, another problem is the, uh, the heart is being wrongly trained. I used to think the problem is you're not training the heart, but, but in reality, whatever I use to motivate behavior trains the hearts of my children because behavior and the heart are so inexorably bound together. If I motivate them with guilt, I teach them to be people who respond out of feelings of guilt. I can motivate them with shame and teach them to be people who respond out of 
feelings of shame, or I can motivate them with, with the fear of man. What will people think of you if you act like that? And I teach them the fear of man. Or I can motivate them with pride. You don't want to be like those liars. You're better than that. I know you're better than that. I'm using pride as a motivation. But whatever I use to motivate behavior trains the hearts of my children. And of course, when I'm manipulating behavior, the gospel will never be the core of my message to my kids. I mean, think about it. When I'm red-faced, hollering threats at the kids, you don't even want to know what will happen if I come to that room one more time. And besides that, God in love sent his son to die so that you could know new life. So there. I mean, you can't, you can't tag the gospel onto the end of a threat. Those are two radically different systems of motivation. They, they don't marry together. And of course, my willingness to manipulate the behavior, my willingness to settle just for behavior without dealing with the heart really indicates the idols of my heart. You know, I'm proud. I want ease. I want convenience. I have the fear of man. What will people think of me? I'm a pastor. I can't control my children. So it's so easy for me to be motivated by things that ought to be repented of when it comes to the raising of my kids, because I want, I'm, I'm expecting my kids to make me look good. And, and you know, the, the scriptures help us know where to go with all this. You know, the, uh, the Bible reveals the heart. One of the, one of the uses of the word of God is to expose the heart. You know the verse, Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than a double-edged sword. And it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. One of the uses of the Scripture is to help us to understand our hearts and to understand how profoundly we need the grace of God. Of course, the heart shows where the action is because the, the heart is, 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 is always at work. I mean, I think of of James chapter 4, he says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that wage war within you? You want something and you don't get it. James says the reason for fights and quarrels is your heart. Imagine this illustration with me. Now, this would be an old illustration for me because all my kids are grown. But imagine I come home from work. I'm trying to pull my car into the driveway. There's a bicycle right in my path. Got to put the car in park, get out of the car, move the stupid bicycle, get back in the car, pull my car into the driveway. I feel very provoked with the child who owns that bicycle. So I go in and I find him. I say, why did you leave your bicycle in the driveway? I told you a hundred times, never leave your bicycle in the driveway. Next time I'm going to drive over it. I will. I, I, I didn't do it today because I was afraid of damaging my car, but I don't care. I will drive over it. Don't you ever leave your bicycle in the driveway again. And the child, in his own defense, he says, Daddy, I just went in for a minute because I had to go to the bathroom. I don't want your excuses. I don't care if you wet your pants. I never want you to leave your bicycle in the driveway again. Now, if you came along at this moment and you said, Ted, 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 why are you so angry? What am I likely to say? I'll tell you why I'm angry. The kid left his bicycle in the driveway. I told him a hundred times not to do it. But think about it. The bicycle in the driveway is not why I'm angry. It's when I got angry. Why am I angry? <laughs> it's desires that wage war within. I, mean, I, I want my will to be done on earth as God's will is done in heaven. I want to speak and it happens. <laughs> I want to say, let there never be a bicycle in the driveway and there's never a bicycle in the driveway. I want to be God. This child's reminding me that I'm not. You see, the reason... The, the, the reason for the anger has to do with desires that wage war within. And of course, uh, we want to help our kids understand their hearts so they can, they can pray with the psalmist in Psalm 139, Lord, search my heart, try my thoughts, see if there's any wicked way in me, lead me in the way everlasting. Now, we're in this 
wonderful situation as God's people, we have great resources for understanding the heart. And here's a, just a list of some of those attitudes of heart. When we talk about the overflow of the heart, that's an abstract concept. But here's the concrete reality of it. It's all these things in the heart. It's, it's revenge rather than entrusting myself to God or fear of man rather than the fear of the Lord or pride rather than humility or love of self rather than love for others or uh, self-preservation rather than being willing to lay down my life for others or fear rather than knowing the perfect love that drives out fear or covetousness rather than generosity or envy rather than a desire for the good of others or hatred rather than love or anger rather than peacemaking or bitterness rather than forgiveness or a people pleasing a desire for approval rather than a desire for God's approval or a fear and anxiety Paul talks about that in Philippians 4 rather than knowing peace and contentment or rebellion rather than submission it's these things in the heart that push and pull behavior and one of the suggestions I made yesterday in talking about these things is that you can develop a heart notebook with your children and just look at passages that that use these terms. These are all biblical terms. Look at passages that use these terms, write them out in your heart notebook, illustrate them, talk to the kids about it, and, and help your children to develop a fund of knowledge from the Word of God about the heart and the importance of the heart. Because, see, it's these attitudes of heart that push and pull behavior. It's these attitudes of heart that are the answer the question, why do the kids fight and quarrel? Why are they disobedient to us? Why do they, are they not kind and gracious to one another? It's these things inside that are pushing and pulling. And of course, the same thing is true with us too, because every one of your struggles with sin, every one of your struggles with things that you say and do that you know you should not say and do are tied to attitudes of heart. In fact, if you think about this list, you can identify one or two or three or four things on that list that are your typical heart struggles behind the things that you do and say that are wrong. Maybe it's pride or compulsive self-love or a low flashpoint, a kind of a seething anger that's like a barn swallow just looking for a place to land. And it finds a place to land so many times every day. Or a spirit of rebellion that is just rebellious toward any restriction or any rules from anybody. But all those things in the heart are the things that motivate behavior. And it's not just true for our children, it's true for you and me. In fact, if we're going to help our children to understand their hearts, we've got to make personal application of this for ourselves. Because the insights you gain in understanding what are the things that motivate me, what are the reasons why I lie, what are the reasons why I speak harshly to others, What are the reasons why I indulge myself in ways that I should not indulge myself? What, what's behind that? You see, as you understand those attitudes within yourself, that's really what equips you and enables you to ask good questions of your children and to get beyond just simply uh, trying to urge them to do the appropriate things externally, but really helping them to understand the temptation to stray from God. And if you ignore the heart, see if you ignore the heart, then parenting is reduced to, to managing, to managing behavior. And most people, their view of parenting is managing behavior rather than nurture. But if we think about this, this really equips us for every generation ministry because we're, we're endeavoring to understand those attitudes of heart that push and pull and help our children to understand those things. Because the more we understand those things, the more we will understand how profoundly we need God and God's grace and God's goodness. You see, another problem too, if I miss the heart, I will miss 
right behavior that is done for wrong motives. I used to always warn our school teachers in our Christian school about this, because you can have a child who, who is always obedient to the teacher, who's the first one where you say, okay, put away this book, get out this book, line up now for recess, whatever. This child's very obedient, very compliant. And if we only focus on behavior, we're going to miss the needs of that child, because it could be that that obedience and that compliance is driven by a craven desire to make the teacher happy or is driven by a fear of being disapproved by somebody. And even though it's externally appropriate behavior, it's actually feeding idols in the heart. And, and, and it's, it's behavior, the, while the behavior is not wrong, the attitude of heart needs to be repented of. We will miss that kind of subtlety if we just focus on behavior. But the more we focus on the heart, the more we help our children to understand how profoundly they need the grace of the gospel. You know, the, uh, Ezekiel 36 talks about this. It's such a key text. Uh, you know, we ha uh, it says, I will cleanse you from all of your impurity and all of your idols. We have a profound need for cleansing. And we, we need, you and I need that. Our children need that. We need to be cleansed. We need to have the idols of our hearts removed. We need to have a radical heart transplant surgery. Ezekiel talks about that. He says, I will take out your heart of stone, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And we need empowerment that comes from God. And that's in the passage, too. I will put my spirit in you to cause you to walk in my ways and remember my commandments. You see, the more we focus on the heart, the more we help our children understand how profoundly they need the grace of God. And the less we focus on the heart, the more we focus just on behavior, behavior doesn't require grace. Behaviorism doesn't require grace. There are behaviorists all over this Los Angeles, greater Los Angeles area who are managing their kids with behaviorism. They don't need the gospel to do that. You just create the incentives and the disincentives that motivate behavior. But if we're going to deal with the heart, we have no other hope than the gospel. Because it's only the gospel that can change us and transform us. I remember one time my daughter, we had put her to bed. She was about eight years old. Put her to bed and I passed by her room a little while later, thinking she would probably be asleep by now, but I could hear her crying in her bed. And I, I went in, I said, honey, what's the matter? Knelt down by the bed, rubbed her back. Tell daddy why you're crying. What's upsetting you? And, and she said, she was weeping. She said, daddy, you and mommy are always telling me I have to love my brothers from the heart. I can't love them from the heart. If you knew how mean they are to me, you would understand. I can't love them from the heart. I can't love them. You're asking me to do something that's impossible for me to do. And it was a wonderful opportunity for me to, to come alongside her and say, you're right, honey. You can't love your brothers from the heart without the grace of God, without God's grace. I can't love you as I ought to love you as a daddy. I can't love mommy in the ways I ought to love mommy without God. We need God. We need God's grace. We need God's help. We need God's enablement. So you, God is the one who can enable you to love your brothers. It was a wonderful opportunity for me to talk about the gospel and her profound need of grace. And see, that's where we all are. Whatever your struggles are today, whatever the things are about you that you're unhappy with, that you know are contrary to God's word and God's purposes for you, things, these intractable sins, those things you fall into again and again, whatever those struggles are, they're all tied to heart issues. And they all show how profoundly you need the grace of the gospel. And we need to continually be repenting and casting ourselves on Christ. Because repentance and faith are not just the initiation right into Christianity. They're part of the grace in which we stand. And we have a Savior who came into our world, who lived in flesh like ours, who was subject to all the struggles that we're subject to in a fallen world. And he lived without sin so that we could have righteousness. And he died as a sacrifice of our sins so the guilt of our sins could be atoned for. 
And he is full of grace and power and enablement to change us and transform us and empower us and enable us to live for him and for his glory. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you asking that you would help us to be people who think deeply about our hearts and how profoundly we need you and your grace. Help us to be people who are not superficial in our ways of viewing the Christian life or striving to live for you, but help us to be people who are deeply evangelical as we think about our need of you and our need of your grace and enablement. And we pray, Father, that you would enable us to bring your truth to our kids, to not only talk to them about it, but to exemplify it in a life of humility and a life of, of uh, honoring you and loving you. We pray this for Christ's great glory. Amen.